Paul Adams has been a professor of photography at BYU since 2002 and has been photographing for over 30 years. His work has been displayed both nationally and internationally, and his photographs are included in several permanent collections, including the Nora Eccles Museum of Fine Art, uh, Chattahoochee Valley Art Museum, the Tenba Corporation, the Chicago Institute of Art, and Brigham Young University's Museum of Art. He's lived in Europe as a Fulbright scholar and taught photography in northern England. Born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, he grew up backpacking and exploring the nearby coastal ranges, as well as running rivers above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. Paul Adams received a master's degree in photography in 1996 and has taught photography at Utah State University, the Florida Keys, and Brigham Young University. Uh, Paul's been a part of our judging uh, for the International Study Program's photo competition. Uh, if you have seen the, uh, the winners uh, out here in the hallway, you'll notice um, his good work along with uh, Professor Chip Oscarson from the College of Humanities and Professor Roland, Ho Roland Hodges from the College of Engineering. Uh, we, uh, we rely on, on the good work of, of faculty who coordinate our international study, or who direct our international study programs. And it's with this in mind that we are, are thinking toward the, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of images that are taken by you on study abroad programs, internships, and field studies. We thought it would be an exciting way to kick off the semester to talk about how we can improve uh, the quality uh, of those photos. I certainly think the quantity is, is quite high, um, but as an amateur ph photographer, we all know, uh, you know the challenges, and, and, and I think, uh, I'm guessing you're here because we, we want to learn how to do better. So we've asked Professor Adams to speak on how to improve your study abroad photography. Uh, please join me in welcoming Paul Adams. All right. So what I want to talk about right now is uh, not so much about uh, technique. Uh, I we just don't have time to talk about technique. What I want to talk about more is ideas and concepts and maybe your mindset and your approach to your photography, especially while you're traveling. How many people here, by the show of hands, have seen a good photograph? I don't, however you want to translate that, a good photograph. Okay. Now, obviously, by the show of hands, how many of you have seen a bad photograph? Okay, there's probably more hands up. What's the difference? You tell me. I want to get some ideas from you. What's the difference in your mind between a good photograph and a bad photograph? Now, what I don't want is I don't want specifics. I don't want to have you say, well, a good photograph should be in focus or a good photograph should have color. Those are specifics. I want ideas or concepts. What generally in your mind makes a good photograph? Yeah. It's not a waste of time to look at, okay? Waste o time. Okay? And we'll put an international no sign through that. All right, what else? Yeah? You're able to associate your pictures with the right way you might you as a visitor have thought to take it. Okay, you can associate with it. Okay, in the back. Yeah, it, it, emotion behind it, or it communicates emotion. It moves the viewer emotionally. So when you say, wow, that really moves me, what do you mean? It moves you emotionally. Okay, good, excellent. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Okay, uh, good, good, good. I'm going to put, uh, I'm just going to say unity in there. Is that all right? Okay. I saw a couple other hands. A couple more. Did I get Same thing? Any others? All right, let, and going along with what was said in the back, let me take off on this idea that it moves you emotionally. Let me submit this to you and see if this agrees to you. A good photograph can do a thousand different things, but ultimately it should be communicating something. And that communication can be an idea, it can be a concept, it can be an emotion, it can be a feeling, but it's communicating something. And what a lot of uh, photographers, uh, I don't think they do, is think about what they're trying to communicate. Now, I know all of you are intelligent people. I know you are, or you wouldn't be here. So think through your photographs before you actually release the shutter. Now, I know when we're traveling, and how many of you have already traveled to study abroad? Anybody yet? Okay. This is what happens, right? You've got your point and shoot. You're going along. Whoa! Click, that was cool. 
moving along, all right? We're moving, we're moving, you're following the tour guide, whatever, we're moving. And you don't really take the time to slow down and really think through what you're doing. So that's what I'd like to do today is kind of talk a little bit about that and how to think through it. All right, so the, the, uh, the title of this lecture was Getting Beyond the Cliché. So let me ask you that. Before we can get beyond the cliché, what is cliché? What does that mean to you? Excellent. Something that's been overdone, superficial, trite, scratches the surface, redundant. All of those things would be cliché, right? How many people have seen the photograph or a photograph of a small child with a skin probably darker than ours, with big eyes, nice white smile, looking into the camera, and down point of uh, looking down on it, click, there it is. Have you seen that photograph? Right. Cliché, right? Why do we take those photos? Why, do we, why, do, why does that happen so often? This is what I want to submit. Yeah, go ahead. Because they're cute. <laughs> okay, because they're cute. Or how about this? As beginning photographers, as kind of novice photographers, the trap that we tend to fall into is taking a photograph because it looks like a photograph. Now that sounds a little esoteric. Let me explain that a little bit better. We take a photograph because we've seen something like it already in the back of our minds. And because we've seen something like it already, then it must be good. So then I'm going to do it. And what I would challenge you to do is, as it says there on your handout, if you look through the viewfinder, and most of us don't have viewfinders anymore. Now we're looking on the back of our cameras. But if you're looking on the back of your camera and you've seen something you've seen before, don't bother releasing the shutter. Now, does that mean you need to go find subject matter that's never been seen before? No. But what it does mean is you've got to stop and analyze and think about yourself. Why am, what drew me to this? I have a 360 degree view of the world, and for some reason I was drawn to that little child. Okay, so now what, what think about it, why? What is it about? Is, what emotion is that child communicating to you? Uh, you're standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Right? The Eiffel Tower. Wow! Eiffel Tower! And so a lot of us will fall into what I call trophy photography. My, uh, my brother is a big time hunter. He's a hunter. I'm not a hunter. He's a hunter. And when he kills an animal, he wants to bring it home and put a trophy of that animal on his wall. And I think a lot of us approach travel photography the same way. I'm at the Eiffel Tower. Click. Here it is on my wall. So I was there. Let's get beyond that. You're standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. What does it make you feel? Wow. Ooh. Oh, wait, you can smell the Nutella on the, on the crepe vendor right next door, right? Yeah, and there's maybe some Parisian music being played, and it's really uh, the wind's blowing, and it's exciting. Can you capture those emotions? Can you capture that feeling somehow? The challenge, the hard part is you're there. When we're traveling, our senses are, are just snapping. We're seeing new things for the first time. We're excited. And now you've got to translate that onto a two-dimensional surface about this big and give it to somebody else and have them feel the same thing. So think it through. How are you going to do that? How can you somehow communicate the emotion that you're feeling or the ideas that you're having and then translate that on a two-dimensional surface so that a viewer will feel those same things. Easier said than done. All right, so let's look at some of the, um, some of the, I, I know I don't have enough of these. I, I handed them out before we started. I had 50 and there's more than 50 people here. So maybe if uh, you're sitting next to somebody that has one, you can share with them and pass another one along. But let's look, at over, uh, look over some of, uh, some of these ideas as far as composition. Also, uh, at the very top there, there's the quote that I want to have uh, tattooed on the back of your eyelids. If when you look through the viewfinder, you see something you've seen before, don't release the shutter. Let's talk a little bit about composition. The co what composition means or how elements within the photograph are arranged against each other, okay? Compositional rule number one. What's compositional rule number one? There are no rules. So why are they called rules? As youth, we love rules because then we can break them. But why are they called rules if there are no rules? 
Why they're called rules is because the idea is if you follow these, you can have a predictable result. That's why they're called rules. It doesn't, they're, they're not laws. You don't have to do them. You can just predict the results. All right, so let's go through these. Fill your frame with your subject matter, cropping effectively without wasting precious space. Remember this. You have very little real estate. Here is the size of your real estate. Your frame. Use it. Use all of it. And be aware of everything that's in that frame. As human beings, what we tend to do is our eyeballs focus on whatever we're taking a picture of. I'm taking a picture of you. What's your name? Spencer. And because I'm taking a picture of Spencer, all I'm doing is looking at Spencer, and I don't realize that what's your name? Rachel, Rachel is popping out of the top of Spencer's head. The camera's going to see that, but my eyeballs just focus on Spencer. So the first thing that I would challenge you to do is before you release the shutter, physically move your eyeball around all four edges of that frame and look at your real estate. What's going on? And are you in control of what's going on? Are you even aware of it? Okay. Dead center is often dead unless used very conscientiously. We don't always have to put whatever we're taking a picture of right smack in the center of the frame. That's actually pretty stagnant. That's actually a pretty boring way to take a photograph. Who knows what the rule of thirds is? Rule of thirds in the back, what is it? Excellent. Well put. You should come be a TA. So we divide it three uh, uh, in thirds going that way. We divide it in thirds going that way. Where these intersecting lines meet is a more interesting place to put your subject matter. It's just one of the rules. It just is. Try it. All right. So that was number three, the rule of thirds. How convenient. The rule of thirds is number three. Okay. Number four. Turn your camera vertically on vertical subjects. Don't use horizontal framing for everything. We tend to go through life taking pictures from eye level horizontal. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, crazy. Turn it vertical, all right? So instead of having the Eiffel Tower going through like so, with all this empty space on the side and and we're cropping it top to bottom. Hey, wow, well, let's just turn it this way. Whoa, the Eiffel Tower fits. Okay? Now, I, I, I'm making fun of that. That sounds kind of obvious, but for some reason it's not that obvious. Divide space asymmetrically, especially this uh, space is divided by the horizon line. Once again, here's your frame. If you're outside, and oftentimes we are in when we're traveling, there's always a horizon line. Even if you can't see it, it's implied. Even if there's buildings in the way, the viewer is going to know where the horizon line is. Where do we place it? If we place it right smack in the center, again, that tends to be kind of static, kind of boring. So just simply by placing it on one of these rule of thirds lines, so we place it down here on that third line, then that's going to emphasize something. It's going to emphasize the background. It's going to emphasize the sky. If we place it up here on the top thirds, it emphasizes the foreground. Maybe it's kids playing. Maybe it's buildings or whatever, and it de-emphasizes. So it, it gives interest to the photograph. Number six is easier said than done. Mix absolute order with the chaos of complexity. If your photograph is too controlled, it can be boring. It needs a little bit of variety. Variety is the spice that gives the visual interest to a photograph. Leave space in front of moving objects or in the direction of implied movement or sight. This is one of those things I just can't explain. It just works. If you've got a guy on a bicycle, you're in China, guy on a bicycle. That's actually a son on a bicycle for some reason. <laughs> All right. And he's moving. Have him moving into the frame as opposed to moving out of the frame. What will happen, does anybody happen to know how a viewer uh, uh, approaches a photograph? Where do the eyeballs come into a photograph? Does anybody know? Yeah, in our Western society, we, we read a photograph the same way we read, left to right. Well, the viewer comes into the photograph over here. 
follows through the photograph, sees the moving object going that way, and goes right out the other end. So if you have the, uh, uh, the object moving into the frame, then the, the viewer's eye will stay in the frame. Use odd number of objects in your composition. Here's another one I can't explain. It just works. It just is more interesting. Odd number of objects. Two trees. Boring. A third object. More interesting. <laughs> it just is. Ignore compositional guidelines when necessary to create purposeful tension attention or drama. So in other words, these rules that I've just gone over, they have predictable results, but once you know those results, then you can break these rules to get different results. Number 10 is also easier said than done, but rely on and trust your intuition. If it feels, when you're looking through the viewfinder, if it feels interesting to you, it is. Trust yourself. If it feels good to you, it is. Trust yourself. You guys are smart, thinking, feeling people, so trust your gut. I know I've got a good photograph in front of me when I look through the viewfinder and I just go, oh, yeah, and I take the picture and then I don't want to take the camera down. I just want to keep looking at, oh, yeah, oh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. So if it feels that way to you, go ahead and take the shot. And that's the nice thing about digital mistakes who cares right there's no expense to mistakes so it's better to just try things and take risks and I've never seen a photograph like this before but it sure feels good take the shot you know later if you look at it just dump it and throw it away all right I'm not going to talk so much about the uh, principles and elements of design that are also uh, down here on the bottom of this of this handout but take a look at them yourself and read through them a little bit Okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, in the limited time that we have before we look at some slides here is I want to talk about light. Light is uh, by far the most important tool that you have to work with. And most of us, uh, when we're traveling, are going to be dealing with natural light. That's usually what we're going to be photographing with. Maybe there might be an occasion where we're indoors, but generally I found, at least in my experience, I'm working with natural light, even if it's people, landscape, architecture, whatever. So I want you to, uh, I want to talk about some things that will hopefully get you thinking about natural light. There are four qualities of light that affect the character of light. I had a professor once tell me that just because you can see doesn't mean you do. All of us see the light but I want you to start really seeing the light. Has anybody seen uh, the movie Blues Brothers? It's R-rated. Oh, okay. Do you remember the scene where Jake, they're at the church, and it's before Jake gets the idea to put the band back together, and that shaft of light comes down, and he turns to Elwood, and he says, Do you see the light? Right? And then he does handsprings down the center aisle. That's what I want to ask you is, do you see the light? Do you take the time to slow down and really see the light? Somebody describe the light in this room to me right now. What color is it? It's not white. Your eyeballs think they are, but it's not. What color is it? It's kind of a greeny yellow. These lights are yellow. These lights are green. What else? How else would you describe this light? Is it pretty flat and even? Yeah, right here underneath these fluorescents, it's very flat and even. Over here, it's a little more specular, right? We've got lights that are just kind of lighting up the walls there. What's the direction of the light? All from above. I don't see any light coming from any other direction. What's the intensity of the light? Low. The nice thing about our eyeballs is we have pupils and, and irises that, re 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 right? Cameras don't have that much control. So, I mean, they do, but they don't do it automatically. Our eyes do it automatically. We walk into a dark room, and then it appears light to us. So I want to write these characteristics of light down. We have intensity, color, direction, and contrast. What does contrast mean? Contrast means 
the relationship between light and dark, how extreme that relationship is, and the transition between the two. So a very contrasty light has a, uh, an extreme transition. I don't really, well, these are more contrasty than those, but the transition from highlight to shadow here is, uh, it's, eh, it's pretty broad actually, so that's not a terribly contrasty light. But the transition out here is almost non-existent. Do you see shadows? There's shadows under the chairs, and the difference between the light here and the, the, the shadow under the chair isn't that much, so there's not a lot of extreme there. And the transition between the light and the shadows and the chairs is very gradual. So this is a very low contrast light. Okay? The opposite would be noonday sun. Noonday sun is a very contrasty light source. The, the difference between highlight and shadow is extreme, and the transition between the two is very sharp. Very contrasty lighting is generally not a very flattering photographic lighting. Um, all right. So these are the four uh, kind of qualities or characteristics of light that we need to be thinking about and conscious of. So as we're talking about daylight, what are the things that affect these qualities in daylight? What affects the intensity of daylight? Weather. What else? Time of day. Anything else? Location. Who said that? Location as far as what? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the light at the equator is different than the light at the North Pole. Um, I've been up above the Arctic Circle. The light above the Arctic Circle is fantastic. I'll talk about that in a second. All right. What else affects uh, the color of daylight? Weather. Time of day. Time of day is the kicker. If there's one thing that I could communicate to you that will make your photography better, get up in the morning. Sometimes the only difference between a good photograph and a bad photograph is your ability to get out of bed when the light is beautiful. Because the 30 minutes before the sun comes up and the 30 minutes after it goes down is what we refer to as the sweet light. And it is gorgeous. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? That evening light. You've all seen the evening light. I don't know if you've seen the morning light. <laughs> but the evening light, it has that kind of powdery glow to it, right? It's just, I mean, you can almost reach out and just lick it. It's just goldy, feathery. You know what I'm talking about? So those 30 minutes, those times a day, when I'm traveling, I'm out of bed and I'm walking around taking pictures during the sweet light. Beautiful, beautiful light. I won't go into what causes that. All right, what affects, first of all, how do we know, how do we visually see what is uh, the direction of the light? What are the clues that, that tell us the direction of light? Shadows. The shadows, right? Where are the shadows? So what affects the direction of natural light? Excellent, perfect. Anything that's reflecting off of it. It might be a big uh, uh, red cliff. It might be water. It might be, yeah, anything. What else affects the direction of sunlight? Where you are on the planet, yeah, right. And the time of day, yeah. So for example, out at the salt flats, I don't know if you've ever been out there, in the morning, it's so flat out there that as soon as that sun peeks up over the horizon, you've got shadows that just go whew, and they just race for about a quarter of a mile. And so the direction is very directional. And what that means is you've got very dramatic shadows. In the middle of the noonday sun, the direction is straight overhead. Where are all the shadows? Right smack underneath whatever you're taking a picture of. For people, that's terrible light because the shadows are here underneath their eyes or underneath their eyebrows in their eyes. All right, contrast. What affects the contrast of natural light? Weather. Weather. Yeah, if it's a cloudy day, it's very soft, even contrast. Anything else? Ah, yeah. Some of the best lighting is out at the north end of the Great Salt Lake. 
because all of those oil refineries, all of their gunk just floats out over the lakes. As photographers, we love air pollution. It just creates beautiful quality of light. It really does. All right. I was talking about the, North, uh, the Arctic Circle. Uh, does anybody know why the Arctic Circle is called the Arctic Circle? There's not a line on the ground. Why is it, why is it the Arctic Circle? Exactly. So it's the part on the planet where during the summertime the sun never sets. So it's, um, it's right up here, Arctic Circle right there. So during the summer the sun never sets. So what do you have? You've got 23 hours of sweet light. The sun comes right up over the horizon. For 23 hours it just circles. And then for about an hour it just barely dips below the horizon. It's still light. And then it comes back up again. It's, as a photographer you're just going crazy. It's just, it's just sweet light all day long. So that's what I want to um, invite you to do and to implore you to do, is when you're photographing, you don't have, you know, we probably don't have a lot of flashes. We don't have a lot of professional control. We have sunlight. Be aware of what, what it's doing, what it, uh, how the, the conditions affect your subject matter, and photograph during those sweet light times. Get up in the morning, uh, finish dinner early so you can get out walking around, you know, as the sun's starting to set. I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Okay. In fact, let's do that right now. We're kind of running out of time. So these first couple of images, I... I um, I purposely chose because they're uh, subject matter that's photographed a lot, right? But let's see if these, these photographs, if maybe they're a little bit unique, a little bit different. How many photographs have you seen of the Eiffel Tower? A million. When I was there, the Eiffel Tower it was just kind of a magical place to me, and so I wanted to create a photograph that made it feel magical. Um, this was on the top of the Arc de Triomphe, and uh, in the evening, Nice light. What's the light like? It's low contrast. It's raking from over here, so we've got highlights and shadows. It's a beautiful color, and then there's nothing more magical than three clouds that just kind of drift by and waited for their photograph to be taken over the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Has anybody been to Mont Saint Michel in, in France, right? How many photographs have you seen of the Mont Saint Michel? A lot. Have you seen this one before? I hope not. <laughs> um, when I was there, I, I don't know, uh, everywhere I go in the world, there are German tourists. Those guys get out there. They really do. And, uh, and there are just tourists everywhere. And so this was the experience that I had at Mont St. Michel. This is, I was actually there on my honeymoon. My wife was ready to move on. But anyway, so uh, yeah, the relationship between the, the tourists there and, and that beautiful, beautiful building. Pyramids, geez, how many, is it, is it possible to take a new photograph of pyramids? Yeah. Scout it out, try different camera angles, try different altitudes, try different perspectives, different times of day. I know we don't have that much time when we're out traveling, but think, it, think about it. The Flatiron Building in New York, has anybody seen the Flatiron Building? How many photographs have you seen of the Flatiron Building? I actually took this with my wife's point-and-shoot camera. I was just walking this, whoa, whoa, <laughs> click. So you don't need fancy, expensive equipment. Um, I put this one, and this is one of my student photographs from a, a beginning class. So this was a beginning student. And the reason why I put this in there here, does anybody recognize where that is? That's Utah Lake. Utah Lake? That's a stinky old mud puddle. What time of day did he go out there and shoot it? In the morning. The sun's coming up down Provo Canyon. Uh, he was up at 3 in the morning to get out there for the sunrise. Beautiful light, beautiful color, beautiful time of day. Uh, three hours from four hours from now, it's back to a stinky mud puddle.
What makes this photograph? The color, right? Time of day. That's all it is. That's a morning shot. Well, I have to put that in context. He also paid a photographer's fee to be able to be there in the morning and climb on top of one of these other temples, so he had to put some effort into it. But. The Grand Mosque in Morocco, evening light. Now, not only is it evening light, but it's weather. Uh, a lot of air pollution and a lot of what we call plush, which is just moisture in the air coming off the ocean, creates this beautiful, beautiful color up here. Rule of thirds, a little bit. Uh, kind of in the center here, but kind of on the rule of thirds on this side. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question, and, and we're going to look at some people's uh, photos here and talk about people in a second. But as far as asking their permission, um, it, it really depends on the situation. It really does. This is the only thing that I would say is be respectful. Uh, the very act of photographing is kind of um, just doing, is kind of exploitative. It just is. It's just the nature of it. So be aware of that and be respectful. Um, I have found that uh, most people don't care, and if they do, then fine, I don't photograph them. But I usually ask for forgiveness instead of permission. <laughs> photograph them, is it okay? No? Okay, never mind. Samoa, again lighting, time of day. Uh, this is right, the international date line is right out here in the water. So that's tomorrow, right there. <laughs> this is the only place in the world you can see the future. You can <laughs> see what the tomorrow holds for you. Yeah. I think they now started the rainwater like crazy. All these empty areas. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is some uh, minor color correction and things like that uh, done in the computer, but there is no... Uh, like uh, compositing or cutting and pasting or yeah yeah mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah otherwise I wouldn't have taken it you know I'm standing there going ooh yeah and that was in the morning has anybody been to Stonehenge did you see this photo <laughs> could you even get close to it no, there's a big fence around it. But on summer solstice, one day out of the year, they take the fences down, and, they, and I had to travel a whole day to get there. I could talk a story about this photograph just real quickly. They have these really tight parameters that nobody can touch the rocks or get on the rocks. <laughs> so this guy clams up there, and I probably shouldn't be telling this story. But uh, I referred to him as the Lizard King because he was up there being all, oh, look at me. And, and the police came up and said, get down from there. And he's all like, come up and get me. And, <laughs> and once he got down, they hauled him off. But. So uh, sunrise. Uh, the sun's rising right here. Everybody's looking that way, looking at the sun coming up except for Lizard King. <laughs> Morocco. Evening light, beautiful evening light. Again, on top of the Arc de Triomphe, the uh, Champs Elysees here, evening light, the sun setting over here, raking across the city. Beautiful sky, a color in the sky. I'll go through these fairly quick. This is also. Um, this is in Turkey, actually. Cuba. Time of day was paramount in this photograph. This is in the evening, evening light. If you can imagine in your mind's eye how this would look in the middle of the noonday, where would the sun be? Over the top of him, where would he be standing? In the shadow, right? The colors, all of the colors would be very drab, either blown out, uh, highlights, blocking up shadows. But now in the evening, we have low contrast, we have directional light, we have color light. 
all of that is really what's making this photograph. And certainly an interesting location and an interesting guy, but the color, I mean the light, makes all the difference. So let me talk about uh, photographing people uh, real quickly. Um, I, I, I think that sometimes as we're traveling, we kind of launch ourselves into a mentality that I call zoo photography, where we are at a zoo and we are spectators for people on display. Does that make sense? We're, we're going through the zoo and, and the locals are just animals on display for us to photograph. Don't fall into that mentality. Don't fall into that trap. If you can imbue them with, with respect and emotion, the same awe and respect that you felt standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. That's what I, I would encourage you. That's how you should approach the photography of, of the locals, of the people that you're, that you're dealing with. So whether you're doing that through their environment, you're doing a camera angle makes a big difference. What's the camera angle that, camera angle that this was photographed at? Yeah, eye level and a little bit lower than eye level. How many times are we photographing kids, you know, from up here, looking down on them? Uh, this off, uh, oftentimes takes place in kind of third world countries or maybe countries that don't have the standard of living that we have, and we kind of have this elitist approach to them, and, oh, the poor little locals, click. Don't do that. I mean, they're people. And try to capture what makes them people or, or your relationship to them. If you can speak the language, talk to them. Tell them, you know, tell them what you're doing. Tell them, hey, you know, have them, have them help you with the photo. Location, environment. Uh, I'll be honest, I coached that guy a little bit. I photographed him in this, in this space. He actually lived in this space. This is in Cuba. And, you know, and I, and, and I didn't speak Spanish. He didn't speak English. And so I was just kind of, you know, pointing at my camera, asked him to stand there, you know, and, and I said, you know, kind of said, hey, stand over here, look out the window. I was doing this all kind of, you know, charades-like. And <coughs> Eye level. Let them be people. Who speaks Spanish? Nobody? Oh, come on. What does that say? Anybody? What? Given the time. I had somebody tell me that this is all about birth control, but I wasn't sure. I don't know if you can read it. It's at a pharmacy, actually. It's None. I just walked into the room, and that was there, and poof, got it. That's, that's maybe a little bit different between the way you travel and the way I travel. I'm traveling as a photographer, right? So I'm there photographing. That's what I'm doing. And, and honestly, that gets tiresome and cumbersome, and I've got this on my back all day long, and, and there's times I just take it off, and I just want to go out and stop being a photographer. Every time I do that, I go crazy because I'm, oh, I don't have my camera with me. So just out of uh, emotional, just to keep myself sane, I always have my camera with me. Uh, I'm trying to remember why I put this in here. Probably rule of thirds. Uh, where's your center of attention? Where's the most interesting point? Well, kind of right in here. We explore the rest of it, but kind of right in here is what the photograph is about. Rule of thirds, zoom, zoom, right there. Now, if I had put the chairs right smack in the center of the frame, not nearly as interesting. Just real quick, we're running out of time. I just got to tell you, this was Christmas morning in Paris. I was uh, living in Paris all by myself. I was all like, oh, I'm uh, Christmas all alone. Woe is me. I woke up that morning, and there's this massive snowstorm. I was like, that was my Christmas gift from Heavenly Father. I was just, oh, thank you. And I went out and had the whole city to myself because everybody's indoors celebrating Christmas. So I was able just to walk around the whole city with this beautiful new fresh snow, and, and uh, Heavenly Father gave me a Christmas gift that year. Running out of time, I'm just going to slip through these real quick. 
frankly, sometimes you don't have to do anything. If it's a really interesting subject matter, just take the picture. Don't worry about composition. Don't worry about if, if it's something nobody has ever seen before, just, just take the picture. <laughs> All right, we're out of time. Uh, questions, uh, we've got, uh, we're really out of time. But if you can stay, uh, I can answer a few questions and I gotta go to class two. Do you have pictures of the people that are in the water? Can you use examples? No, that's all natural light. So they're up, there's windows, come, uh, doors open or windows are open. It's better. Oh, sorry. Um, as far as equipment that you bring, do you think um, that it's more important to bring your professional camera out there so you have all the settings, or just having a point and shoot so it's more readily accessible? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, uh, me, the type of photographer that I am, I'm going to have my professional equipment, but you've got to be much more anal about keeping it safe, keeping it from being stolen, all that kind of stuff. I think it's worth it. But on the other side of my mouth. You can take great photographs with a point and shoot. You don't have to have fancy, expensive equipment. Great. Thank yep, one more. I know you travel as a photographer, but I'm traveling, trying to not act like a tourist. So how do I take, keep a camera on hand and not look like an American with a camera? You know what I'm trying to say? Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, I wish we had more time to talk about it. Um, just the fact that you have a camera puts a big error on you that you're a tourist, right? But how, I guess how you associate with your surroundings, how you associate with the people, and the places that you go, I think, make a big difference. If your overall demeanor is one of respect and being a traveler and not a tourist, I think makes a big difference. And getting off the beaten path. You know, getting out, out away from where all the tourists are and associating with the people, talking with them, being a part of their lives, and, and, and then being as inintrusive as possible when you take that photo. Thanks. We'll see you all.